went to the NBA for a little bit, then played ball overseas, had a bunch of injuries. So I came back to America. Whitney and I, we get engaged. I proposed to her in, in Paris oh, wow. in December. She lives in Nebraska with her daughter. So while I was up there in Nebraska, I got bored. I started working with an irrigation company, just doing something on the side. I was doing it for about two weeks and we're 10 days out from the wedding. And um, just another casual day of work. I'm on this dirt road I'm unfamiliar with, just not locked in to life in that moment. And as I'm going on this dirt road, I didn't realize that the stop sign was literally 20 to 30 feet away. As soon as I realized it, there was not enough time to stop in the hospital. I'm just like, man, why did this happen? Today I'm joined by an amazing guest that I've got a chance to know over the last couple of months, and I can't say how excited I am to have you on this show. Patrick, thanks for joining us today. It's good to be here. Yeah, it's uh, good to have you. I'm just excited for the opportunity, and uh, this is what I, I really love getting a chance to discuss, things that are more impactful and uh really going to bring value to people's lives. And man, you're doing that. For those that don't know who Patrick Young is, uh, <laughs> played for the Florida Gators, Final Four team member, won an SEC championship senior year with them, now broadcasting on the SEC network. Um, but I think one of the more important things here we're going to talk about is extreme man of faith. Yeah. Your life's been changed forever. Yeah. And if you want to talk a bit briefly here, or take as much time as you want, but... Yeah, changes. <laughs> changes in an understatement of what these last year and some change has been. And what, what, what else can you do? You have a choice with everything that happens within our lives of how we're going to allow that situation to define us, how we're going to have our perspective on that thing. A lot of parts of w what has happened uh, in me and to me, I would not have ever written it up to happen that way. I wouldn't have asked for the platform in regards to the impact mm -hmm. and being able to do something that is actually really purposeful. And I have a vision for it now and just seeing the real-time effect, and I'm in the middle still of what people see as a crisis, a life change. I wouldn't have written it up to happen this way, but I'm just grateful that I'm in a position where I can look back and say, all right, things have gotten so much better since then. That it was difficult in the beginning mm -hmm. after my accident, but gosh, the number of blessings I have to count and to be grateful for. And that's the thing about gratitude. When I go and speak and I talk to people about storms in life, preparing for storms, how do you do that? You practice gratitude. Yes. And gratitude is not always the easy choice. Oftentimes, gratitude is the hardest choice, that you're in the middle of something out of your control. It's hard. It sucks. And yet you're saying, I'm choosing to focus my mind on things that I'm thankful that I do have in this moment. Like for me, thankful that I was, number one, thankful that I'm still alive, thankful to still be alive, to have a wonderful family. My wife has been unbelievable just her faith in all of this that she hadn't wavered one second. Ah. It, it literally like we were in the hospital after my accident, after my surgery, and we're playing this card game and it's a, a, a card game to help us facilitate deeper conversation. And the question comes up and it's like, what would you categorize or define or title this phase in our life right now? Okay. What a question. Right. And I'm just like, do you believe? Do you believe, first off, that God is who he is? That God, first off, that God is real, that God is who he says he is, and what God says about you? And if so, what are you afraid of? Mm -hmm. if, if you believe all these things and you've gone to church, you have this foundation of faith, you're in a situation now where God is putting you in a position where you have to, do, as we should always, depend on him for everything. But like really, truly, you're in a position where you say, all right, God, I'm here. This is the situation that I'm in. I can't wait to see what you're going to do. And I'm like, when I could reframe my mind to seeing that and she as well, we're like, oh, my goodness, this is a blessing. I it's think an opportunity. I heard someone say the other day that if you pray, don't worry. But if you worry, don't pray. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? Take us back into yeah. that month of June in Nebraska and, and talk about what got you to that situation you were just describing. So played at the University of Florida, played four years. We actually won three SEC regular season uh, championships. There was no chance we were going to win four because <laughs> the 2012 year was Anthony Davis, Kentucky year, one of the best teams in college basketball history. Right. So a after my career, went to the Final Four. I went at Florida, went to the NBA for a little bit, then played ball overseas, had a bunch of injuries, had a surgery on my knee that didn't go well. Uh, we're, we're going into 
the pa- pandemic year, looking at the pandemic year, it was just a tough time because everything was changed. When mm-hmm. I was over, I was overseas in Europe. Uh, I really enjoyed my time over there, getting a chance to play ball. But just the injuries and then the pandemic, not getting a chance to really live life while I was over there because you had to stay indoors. You couldn't do this. You can't do that. Blah blah. blah. Just you, we know how it was right. in that year for everybody. So I was like, you know what? I don't want to play basketball anymore. <laughs> I want to go on to this next phase and chapter of my life. So I came back, came back to America. This would be in uh, 2021, and okay. heck of a year, uh, great year for me. Back with my family, getting a chance to kind of experience the things that I miss out on for the longest. You know, when you're overseas playing basketball, you're going for 10 months. You miss a lot of relationships, friends, holidays, birthdays, birthdays. you name it. Also getting a chance to dive back into church. I said, you know what, I, I really want to get back involved with Church of 1122, men's groups. I really missed that when I was overseas. There wasn't a, a, a core. Like, as believers, you need to have other believers around you to kind of sharpen you, hold you accountable, help you know that you're kind of focused on spiritual things. So that I was involved back in the church, getting a chance to hang out with, with friends. It's the summertime, going to the beach, just enjoying life. Got my first real job with Tim Tebow's for-profit company, Campus Legends, and then also got hired on with the SEC Network and re- reconnected with yeah. my fiancé at that time. Oh, wow. Because Whitney and I, my wife, we hadn't spoken for three years up until that point. I've known her since college, but we hadn't spoken for three years. So this year, 2021, it was awesome. Yeah, it sounds like Getting it. married, got this great career. We get engaged. I proposed to her in, in Paris oh, wow. in December. And we decided that we were going to get married on July 9th of 2022. So you know how it is, man. Preparing, you're just ready for yeah, that next just chapter. Ready for the day. Just ready, yeah, you're just right. ready to start and and get to that point. And I'm still working with SEC. The season's over around March. Teams didn't do as well as we thought they would do in the tournament. Nobody, not a single team made the final four. <laughs> my lease on my place ended as well. So I said, hey, you know what? My wife, she lives in Nebraska with her daughter, my daughter now. Let's. You know, let me come up there with you guys and spend a good amount of time so we can continue to cultivate relationship. I always just felt so bad that Whitney would come down to visit me and she'd be away from her daughter because, like, they are yin and yang. You know, they are they are so tight. And I, I really envy uh, how close Whitney is with her daughter, with our daughter, something that I'm developing now Under, to this day. Understood. And it's just going to take time. So while I was up there in Nebraska, there's a lot of corn and we're in a small <laughs> town. I did. I got bored while I was up there. When I'm, I was up there in this is May, April, May, around that time, I started working with the irrigation company, just doing something on the side. I had so much time. Also playing a lot of golf. Really enjoyed that. And with this irrigation company, I was working pretty much from 5 a.m. to like 4 p.m. Full days, but it was great work. Uh, you know that it's actually benefiting farmers and people. Uh, you know, if they can't water their crops, they can't feed you know thousands of people around the world or, or you know wherever that may be. And um, just one day after, you know, Re- really hard manual yeah. labor, by the yeah, way. really hard. Yeah. yeah. Oh man, like you, power drills, picking stuff up, working machinery in that hot sun. I I, I, I like I like being outside. So it, it was it was great. And the guy I was working with, great being able to work with him because he he was our boss, but he's in the trenches with us every single day. So it's not like. He's looking over us and saying, oh, you need to do it better. Like, he's he's suffering through everything. And I love that. Okay. I love a boss that's yeah, willing to. just rolls up sleeves right. and gets in there with you. So it, it, I was doing it for about two weeks, and we're 10 days out from the wedding. And just another casual day of doing this work. And we were transporting these large pieces of pivots, the huge things that go in a circle in, in water. Okay, water almost farms. like a huge yeah. sprinkler. Yes, yes. Pretty, pretty much, yeah. But they come in six parts, and we call each one a span. Okay. A span goes about 150 to 175 feet. So you, transporting them is a, it's a, it's a process. It's a task, yeah. <laughs> so we finished up putting the fifth one down and putting it together, and then we're going back to the farm site to get the last one. And and I'm heading out first. It's two miles, two miles away, three miles if that. And I'm on this dirt road I'm unfamiliar with, and we mentioned it before, just not locked in to life in that moment. And as I'm going on this dirt road, not speeding, 30 miles, 35 miles per hour, I didn't realize that the stop sign, once I was coming up and going down the slope, was literally 20 to 30 feet away. As soon as I realized it, there was not enough time to stop and get out of the way. And the reaction was, I'm in an old truck, just like, oh, my gosh, like, this is surreal that, right. you know, 
the car is I'm in a situation that I, there's nothing like we, we've all had a situation where we, yes, drive, yeah. we drive our car and we're just like oh crap you know we yep. can fix it really quickly but there was no fixing this and I realized like that this is ser- it was serious in the car I was just so grateful that there was no oncoming traffic from either way car continues to go parallel to the road as I try to get out of the way that's just my mindset and it flips over down this ditch mm. one time and as soon as all that weight compresses back on all four tires i just felt a pop in the back in my back Mm. and gosh man talk about it was surreal it was i i i I can you know i still think about it sometimes of being in that situation but i'm just so thankful that first off that i was able to grab my phone (laughs) as we mentioned before and that i was able to get help in such a fast manner but i never i never passed out was never unconscious was awake the entire time i ended up i Fractured my T7 in my back, my thoracic spine. I uh, fractured my scapula in my shoulder, my shoulder blade. Didn't need surgery. Bruised a bunch of ribs and then fractured one. That was probably the most uncomfortable part about everything. The ribs. You, you can't laugh. You can't you breathe. Sneeze, you can't, can't do anything. You can't do anything. Wow. Oh, man. And the thing is, no one's around. Like, it's just yeah. you. You know, you mentioned that earlier that there's no one around, there's no oncoming traffic. And you made a comment earlier when we were talking that if you didn't have your phone, you'd have been there for a couple hours. Yeah. If you're a parent, get on the Life360 app because it alerted my family that I had gotten into an accident. So even if I couldn't have grabbed my phone, they would have known that something happened. They would have known and and the dots would have gotten connected some kind of way. I I called my buddy that I was working with because he was well behind me, you know, half a mile behind me. I called him immediately and said, hey, buddy, I crashed. Please call 911. He comes to the stop sign and he's like, where are you? I'm like, oh, because you're, yeah, he because you're in the, couldn't see the vehicle from the road, from the stop sign. That's how deep of a ditch That's how deep, it, yeah, <laughs> it wasn't, it wasn't just like a, it was like, it, it, there was no fencing or anything on that side. It was like, I, I could have gone down for, for a while if that thing would have kept flipping. Wow. I was down there for about 15 to 20 minutes before the ambulance came. I was in a lot of pain. They had they got me in the ambulance and they life flighted me to South Dakota, Sioux Falls. Mm-hmm. That was the nearest and the best hospital I could have could have gone to. My surgeon was actually like, it is a gator. What which are the is odds? Pretty, pretty cool. He had to perform eight and a half hour surgery. Wow. Two rods, twelve screws in my back. I just remember when I was there before surgery, because I was in a good amount of pain at that point, but I didn't want to take anything because I'm like, I know this is, it'll subside. I called Pastor Joby. Joby Martin, and wow. prayed with him. I just remember the man that I was, it was such a nice man that was with me and talking with me the whole time and prayed with me. And we talked about golf. We talked about so many random things, but I just felt the peace of God over me. I didn't have the answers. I didn't know what was next. I didn't know, you know, I'm fearful for the future and all those things at the time, but I just felt a peace of God to say, hey, everything's it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. And I cannot logically explain why and I'm okay with that yeah I don't need to explain logically why because it's not a a formula I just in that moment because the foundation of my faith and God just supernaturally coming up he said everything's going to be okay I'm here with you so man now prior to the accident has your faith always been a huge pillar in your life I would say yes it has been a a, a huge pillar of my life Uh, I've grown up in church, but it, at, at some point, your faith has to become your own faith. I, I'm reading this awesome book called Disciple Making Parent with my wife. You know, there's there's nothing you can do perfectly to raise your kids to choose to follow Jesus. You can put them around the environment. It's a choice that they have to make, and oftentimes they have to experience a little bit of the world. You hope they don't, but I had to experience a little bit of the world and my own sin and seeing like, this is not the path you want to go down to because it's not a restriction basis or of like, don't do these things because I, you know, I'm withholding. It's like, don't do these things because that path doesn't lead down to fruit or Mm -hmm. peace or joy. I just can't even count the number of things that I just like look back and say, man, I wish I would have stayed on the path of righteousness. And I'm just so thankful at the university of Florida. I met a man through athletes in action that helped me first off, to see through his through his life, it wasn't anything he did special, but I just realized that the way he lived his life, I was like, my Christian walk looks, looks nothing like yours. And That's I was powerful. convicted by that. And then he also helped me to see that I can worship God through basketball. I can worship God through 
how I represent myself as a teammate in, in the weight room. And when I was able to reframe my mind and see that, it's like it's, you're not doing something to show out to everybody, but the way you carry yourself, people will notice a difference. And, and your mindset is focused on pleasing God because God doesn't care about results. Correct. He doesn't care about wins or losses. But how? what is your witness out there as you're, you know, in the trenches of practice when you're getting challenged, when are you working your butt off? Are you being a great teammate? Are you able to, you know, even if you mess up, can you apologize? Can you get over those things? And it took me a while to get figure that out. I mean, oftentimes in collegiate sports, we as fans and just people in general forget that some of these individuals are still kids. Right. You're still growing up. Like That's just because so you're legally 18 doesn't mean you've grown up yet. I, I don't think I grew up till I got in my thirties, man. Yeah. There's such a high expectation on, and it's double, it's a double edged sword for sure. Because I'd never would want to take the opportunity away from these, the, the kids that are getting these great NIL deals and the recognition. But, you know, if, if you don't have the right people around you kind of guiding you and keeping your head in a place, like who's working on the character of this right. person? Uh, who's working on the man? Who's preparing them for life when people aren't around, when there's no nothing external around, when the ball stops, when you can't do the things that you used to do, the ball stops bouncing? How are you prepared for life after that? Who are you? Who do people say you are? What do those relationships actually look like? I got to taste that. When I went overseas and had my injuries and whatnot, a lot of people that were my friends when I was at Florida, they, they weren't around anymore. They Stop weren't even calling. trying. Stop calling. Yeah. Stop connecting. So it helped me to see who was real and who was fake. But yeah, it's a big, I wish I had a mentor or somebody else that could have kind of walked and guided me through that. But it's another thing that's hard to trust in that space when you're a, a superstar at age 16, 17 years old, and someone wants something from you. Wow. You hear that story all the time. And you said something where you go that you find out who's really there for you. And when things aren't going your way, you made this comment earlier that the the family and the friends that just huddled around you yeah. during that moment, stopped what they were doing, got on a plane, got to Sioux Falls, yeah. and, oh, and yeah. were theirs. You just you, you talk about how grateful you are for that. But I mean, people yes. stop their lives to be there on a dime. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. My my mom and sister and my wife and some of my best friends when I was in Sioux Falls, they dropped everything to show up for me. And it was, gosh, like you don't really realize, and I'm sure a lot more people would have if they could have. And, and they helped bring light. Like we played game. We play, I got introduced to Monopoly Deal. <laughs> I don't know if you ever played Monopoly Deal. Not mon no, not Monopoly Do Deal. Not play, you will never pick up the board game Monopoly again. <laughs> Because that game is is demonic. <laughs> <laughs> that, <addictive. laughs> that game divides. The card game, first off, it takes 10 to 15 minutes a game. Okay. So that's it's already rapid play. Rapid play. The board game, just get rid of the board game of Monopoly. Okay. Never play it again. Still like the game. You know, still love the story behind it. But the <laughs> card game, when, when I taught my daughter how to play, she won like six or seven times in a row. It's not oh. overly complicated. But having that community, man, and my best friend, Alex, Actually, we won a state championship here at Providence. He came up with, he's really a big part of why I started my foundation. And we were going to think of naming it something like One More, which is pretty funny That's as well. ironic. But the idea behind it was, you know, take, taking one more step, one more mile, one more person of support or whatever it is to, because uh, ideas like with, with spinal cord injuries, with healthcare and, and medicine as well. There's so many people that are underinsured or uninsured that just don't like, I've been so blessed, man, through this process that my insurance has covered like everything, you know, wow. I haven't had any gaps, haven't had to fill in any of those blanks like this spinal, the, on average, the first year of a spinal cord injury, a person is, you know, with insurance that are out of, are out of their pocket, $1.3 million in one year, year. one point three million million. Wow. Yes. Because just, just staying at a spinal cord hospital, I mean, it's probably like $10,000 a day where I was at. I was in at Craig Hospital in Denver for, for five weeks. So our, our idea was, was hey, let's, let's try to find a way to fill in the gaps for those people that are underinsured, uninsured, that don't have the support. Because there's a high level of defeatism that you face when you're told that you may never walk again. You're told that you may never 
be able to do work in the same capacity which right. you, like if if that irrigation job was my primary source of income i you know i wouldn't be able to do that job right you have to change yeah you, you, you may have limitations physically we all have limitations even able body have a physical limitation things we mm -hmm. can and can't do but wanted to let people know hey you can still live a full life and have independence and freedom. But if someone can come in and fill some gaps, maybe financially, maybe emotionally, but whatever it may be, your life can be just as fruitful and awesome as it was before. And his thing, what my best friend has done, he's run a mile every day since my accident. Wow. He's run a mile every single day for me. So I'm going to run a mile until you, until you walk again. And he actually has recruited some other people to join in with him, which has been really awesome. Because it's also wanting to encourage able-bodied people that are not disabled. Hey, how many times have, you know, before my accident, oh, man, I, I got to work out today. I have to go. And it's like, do you not realize how much of a privilege it is? Like, there's people that would. Perspective. Right? That would man. do anything to get up and just run wow. a mile if they could. And it's just to instill that gratitude and encourage people to be mindful of those. You see a person in a wheelchair, you don't know how they got there. But that person more than likely would do anything to not be in it, create some compassion, right? some sympathy, not, not pity, but some sympathy, some empathy in that, in that situation. And, and yeah, that's, that's the, been the cause of the foundation and the, and the idea. And I'm really excited that God's given me this platform to see something that I had not seen before. And it's, it's a huge gap. It's a, it's a huge area that needs some love and attention, and hopefully I can help a lot, a lot, you know, more than just one more. Yep. Every year is going to be one more. And one, one, once I help one person, who's the next one? Yeah. Who's the next one? That's going to be the idea behind that. That's fantastic. That. So, you know, the team over at SEC Network, did you want to go back? Did they ask oh, you man. to come back? Like, what happened? I'm really glad you asked about that. In the hospital, my mindset, so much, again, so much love and support from people all throughout, especially with the SEC community. And I'm just like, man, why did this happen? What's the future going to look like? Fear setting in. Am I going to be able to do the SEC job? And, you know, Pete Waters, my boss, the first thing I, I told him was like, Pete, man, how am I going to be able to do the touch screen again? <laughs> and now that's, I'm much worried about doing the touch screen. Up doing the touch and now, actually yeah. this past Tuesday, it had been the 10th, that was the first time I did the touch screen in my wheelchair. Congratulations. Uh, on TV. So, and it was fine. It yeah. was, but that's the enemy just trying to attack my mind and there doubt go. God. I don't know why we go to fear and things that we can't do. Fear and faith. I think I, I got this from John's book. John, oh, yeah, shout did. out to yep. John, John yep. Gordon. Fear and faith are, have this in common. They are both based on things in the future that have not happened yet. So why choose fear? Patrick, you know the irony behind that statement? I've heard that three times in 48 hours. Really? From different people. <laughs> That's crazy. But SEC, they have been. They were awesome, man. Like. They, they came to me at a standpoint and said, do you want to still do this job? Oh, wow. And I said, yeah, I want to still do it. They were just like, how are you going to, you know, worry about, am I going to be able to travel and, and all this thing? And, and giving credit again to Craig Hospital and those the spinal cord hospitals across the country, they do a fantastic job of helping you get to independence. We did a, a, a trial run at an airport so I could understand what it's like to go through the airport in my chair and all this stuff. Uh, but I did notice, you know, while I was in the hospital, I, I don't want to discount a person that's going through something like this and, and say, you're justified with your emotions. You're mm -hmm. justified with your fears, but those fears end up paralyzing you from seeing the things that you can do and the opportunities that are still out there and that you can overcome those things. Right. You know, I'm there in the hospital and people aren't even trying to make their bed. You, you get to do like an independent trial before you get to leave. And it's like, they will only, they, the nurses will only help you come to you when you call them. Okay. And if you call them, you have to tell them exactly what you need and to do. Other than that, you know, for the whole weekend, you're by yourself. You get to do everything on your own. And, and there was so the first many time. This is the first time you're doing this. Yeah. This was in okay. the hospital. And, wow. and like, I hear the conversations and I'm talking with the nurses and, and people there and they're like, man, I just wish this person could strive and try and they're just so stuck on what's happened. Don't look back at those things and, and be stuck, but look to, okay, this is the situation. Like, I'm like, my situation is what it is. Right. It is not going to change unless 
you know, it may never change, but it doesn't mean I have to be stuck in my mind as well. And people were paralyzed mentally from what had happened. So just through that and learning that process, I'm like, you know what? I am going to become a, a victor over this situation. I wanted to get home so badly too. And then I wanted to help my wife out as much when I got home so I can know how to take care of myself. So it'd be less of a burden on her because she's the one that chose, you know, we, she didn't have to, she didn't owe me anything. We weren't married when I had my accident. And not that I would ever think that she says, would just walk away from me, says a lot about but her. she didn't owe me a single thing. You know, I, I spirit legally, spiritually, we were not married. We're not connected, not joined together. But, and I'm like, you know what? I owe this woman. I owe my, I owe our daughter that I am going to show her in the midst of this. I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to choose to allow the enemy to attack me. I got my days, man. We all get our days. Sure. But I'm like, how can I show up? Nothing, nothing has taken away my choice of how I'm going to show up on a daily basis. Yeah. This, I can still be, and I've said this before, I can still be a great dad. I can still be a great husband. I can still be a great human Love being. It. I can still be a great man of faith. I can still be a positive. Like nothing has changed the way it changes those things. So yeah, I just wanted to like go to those rooms of people and say, hey, man, your life isn't wake over. Up. Hey, like, wake, wake up. up. It's okay. Yeah. You know, that's why I'm so grateful. I'm, I'm here at Brooks Rehab and like I know these things within myself, but sometimes I got to see somebody mm-hmm. else that is choosing joy to get me to light my fire up again to, right. uh, but uh, yeah, man, that's that's been it. Man, what a message. I mean, I, we're surrounded by a brick wall. I'm about ready to run through it right now. <laughs> You're so positive, and I love how you don't choose fear. You know, and I, I heard someone tell me that fear is false expectations appearing real. Yes. You know, and it takes away all the good in your life. You know, and the minute the minute you succumb to that, you're done. And the minute you let go of it, everything's on the other side of it. Yeah. I, I gotta say, the other day it was so cool watching Pat Bradley during the halftime of a game come out and say, "Hey, update on my guy." And it was like Patrick Young, and he showed you putting in the work. He's like, Patrick's putting in the work. And now, yeah. when he says putting in the work, yeah. you know, I think, you know, I think I go to the gym, I put in work. This is not you were putting in work, and you see this, this, uh, you, you were essentially walking. Yeah. You know, yeah. and you were walking, and you could see, you know, your arms are on the treadmill, and you're gripping it, and the yeah. veins are coming out of yeah. your arms, <laughs> and the amount of effort you're putting into this. But you were doing it, man. Yeah. You were doing it, and you were doing it without. You still had a smile on your face. You might have been grimacing a little bit, but right. you were doing it, and we weren't letting fear take over, man. Well, uh, gosh, I don't know where to start with this one. So I, I left Craig, left Craig Hospital, and you know they and I understand. I understand why they do this because the medical world has gotten you know so screwed over at times with wanting to help people have hope for their future, uh-huh. so they have to protect themselves and kind of can't say, hey, one day if you do X, Y, and Z, this will happen. So you know. They, gave, they give you a hope to live independently, but not to walk, not to exceed, you know, expectations. So I come to Brooks, and I had met with the pool therapist. His name John, fantastic guy. His two kids actually swim at the University of Florida, which is pretty cool. So <laughs> I meet with him this one day. He just wanted to sit down and talk and see how I'm doing and evaluate me a little bit. And he's like, Patrick, you will walk again. And I'm just like... Yeah, man, that's cool. Just see see where my mindset was uh-huh. at this point because oh, I got yeah. kind of a little discouraged. And he's like, no, trust me. I, I have helped people that have injuries, a higher up injury level with that can't do this X, Y, and Z. And trust me, it's going to take time. You're going to hate it, but it's possible. He said um, the number one thing is that there's two, two really cool things he told me. They weren't really cool in the moment, <laughs> I guess you would say, but, but – Think looking back at it now, and I'm still living. He said the first thing learned helplessness is the worst thing to affect your recovery. Okay, and I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, that first off, he said your wheelchair, even though it gives you function, gives you the ability to move around, um, it takes away from you ever really having that natural function of walking again. You know, there's no signals going down to your legs when you're just if we're sitting all day. And he, so he said, I want you to get out of your wheelchair when you're home. Okay. Get get he I bought some like goalie pants that have the yep. padding on your knees. It's like I want you to treat your recovery like a baby learning how to walk again. Go back to primal instincts. Start, you know, a baby starts on his back, you know this. Yeah. Starts on starts on the back, they're swallowed up, they're looking around, they're starting to use their neck and their eyes. They eventually learn how to turn over, get on their tummy, tummy time. They push themselves up 
and they start pulling themselves around. And all that is the, the primal instincts you wanted me to start to learn. And he said, within that, he t- looked at my wife and he said, I don't want you to help him with anything around the house. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I bet that was equally as hard for her, too. No. <laughs> no, it wasn't? <laughs> Are you no? kidding me? Oh, I my wife been. is cold-blooded. <laughs> She's like, I ain't helping him with bleep, <laughs> fill in the blank. And and it's like, he's like, John, John, he's like, uh, you know, he probably can't use the microwave and certain <laughs> things. You're going to need to help him out with a few things, but for the most part, okay. make sure he's crawling everywhere. And within that process, you know, things started waking up in my system. My hip flexor started activating. Um, I was wow. starting to starting able to have uh, ability to move my toes. And these are things I wasn't supposed to be able to do. Yeah. Science would say, you know, where the level of my injury, a complete injury, I wouldn't be able to do those things. So, it, you know, my, my thought process and message in that is, you know, you never know what a person may need in a moment, but something so small as that spark of hope you know, I, I, I believed in my heart, in, in my mind, but I needed that touch from John. And knowing that it was going to be a hard path, it, it, it wasn't about it being easy. But right. that touch of him saying, you know, follow this process and it's going to suck. He's like, it's going to suck. You're going to want to cry. You're going to want to. And I did. I, and I still hate it. I still hate being on my stomach all day. But when I just think about the end in mind and the testimony and the, the ability to encourage other people, I'm just like, it's so worth it. Yeah. It's so worth it. Man, I'm so glad you're on here. But, I mean, you need to be out in front of corporations. Yeah. You know, people that are always dealing with adversity in the workforce, I mean, it's always going to be there, right? But the fact that you have the ability to to share a story that says, listen, things happen in our lives, you know? I mean, and it doesn't always have to be something of this magnitude, but something's going right. to happen to you. It Absolutely. is. And we're all affected and impacted by it different ways. But the smile you choose to put on, you know, and and the joy that you're bringing to people and the yeah. energy, I mean, the energy in this room right now, yeah. it's infectious <laughs> in such a good way. You know, I don't even see our cameraman behind me, but I know he's smiling. <laughs> I, I can feel it. And it's 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 part of it. And, you know, you talked about this earlier. You, you said a quote that came from Les Miles. Oh, yeah. And I love it. And honestly, this should be the mantra of your speaking engagement. And what was that quote? Live full, die empty. I love it. Live full, die empty. It's like the 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 ability, or say the ability, but seeing my the fragility of my morality in my eyes and understanding like, hey, we all have it. We all know this instinctually that we have an expiration date, that life is mm. at some point. Uh, so why why are we playing safe? Why are we why are we focusing on things that we can't? And I'm not saying don't have five year ten year plans. So those things are great. But are you living right now? Yes, truly. Are you live? And I'm not talking about prosperity. I'm not talking about things that you can't control. Are you valuing your relationships? Are you living towards those things that you really value? Uh, are you pushing yourself? Are you going after that thing? Yes, book. Job, career, hobby, uh, the right people in relationships. I had been so caught up in just trying to be focus on being liked by people, being a people pleaser, uh, wanting to fit in. And it's like I lost myself. I lost just me, the things that I loved about me, the things that I loved, just because I wanted to fit in with people. When you can fully live and be yourself, you'll attract the right people around you. A hundred percent. Yeah, You'll attract the right people that don't care about, you know, what you can do for them. They just love you for who you are. And uh, this has really helped me to see that so much because I've been so used to being this physical presence of a person my whole life. And, you know, you still, I guess I'm still strong. I was going to say, man, you're a pretty big physical presence. I guess so. Uh, But when when, when that's been stripped away, when the thing that you thought, was so valuable about yourself and stripped away. Who are the people that still? First off, what do you still think about yourself? You know, what does what it do you, define you? Does that you know what what do I still think about myself? Even though I can't squat four hundred pounds like I like I used to be able to do. And then how am I handling? How am I showing up? So, uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's so much I feel like a, a value I think I can bring to people. And you know, I've spoken with companies before here in Jacksonville, and the thing that feedback I've gotten from a lot of people is like, man, your, your accident's only been like four or five months ago and you're doing this. And I'm like, yeah. life is now. Yeah. It's a calling, man. Life is now. I'm not 
waiting for my circumstances to change for me to live, and, and nor should you. If people want to find out more about you and they want to talk to you about speaking engagements, what's the best way for them to get in contact with you? Uh, directly through my email okay. or social channels. Um, Will you give them your handles? Yeah. my Well, my, for, my, my email, okay. don't laugh. Okay. It's, it's very easy to remember. Okay. It's Patman, like Batman, Patman904 <laughs> at gmail.com. Okay. Uh, it's my childhood nickname. I just love it. There you go. It's never going away. Uh, my wife laughs every time <laughs> I say it, Patman904 at gmail.com. And then my social channels, uh, remember, it's Patrick without a K. So it's Patrick Young in the number four. And Instagram, Twitter, those are pr primarily what I use. But, uh, Fantastic. Got to get a website at some point, right? Yeah, got to. Got to. Maybe I'll be Patman. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, Patman.com. But, hey, guys, <laughs> you know, if you – Please take a chance. Go out there, see see what the good work you're doing. And if you need a speaker, I mean, we've got one of the best ones right here in our backyard. We got a lot of them. This is another one to add to the collection. Patrick, thank you for being on the show. It was an honor to have you here, guys. If you like what you're hearing, please share this message. Please share this message. Right click, go you know, five star rate this podcast on whatever platform. We'd love your comments on this and to share it with your friends and family. Patrick, again, thanks for being on the show. Today. Thank you so much for having Absolutely. me. I got one more shot. I'm gonna make it. One more chance, I'm gonna take it. I meant it when I said it, now it's time for me to do it. I got one life to 